everybody. Welcome to Rachel's Reviews. This is a podcast that I look forward to every year. We are talking about the animated films of of the year. We're talking about 2020, which was a really interesting year for animation. And uh, I have with me, I'm, I'm film critic Rachel Wagner, and I have with me, my friend Cameron is here, and he is the host of Renegade Animation, and it's for his blog, camsiview.biz. And thank you so much, Cameron, for coming on the podcast. Um, thank you, Rachel. This is uh, awesome to be back on here. Yeah. So you were on last year when we were talking about 2019, mm-hmm. and now we're talking 2020, and uh, yeah, it's been quite the year. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> it's been yeah. a weird, it's been a weird, stressful year, but I'm glad it it's behind us, even though mm-hmm. 2021 decided to say, hey, hold on, we, we got a little baggage left over. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, though, because I think we've only seen a small portion of of what animation is going to have to kind of give us from 2020 because uh, of course these films take a while to make, but animation was the one, uh, one medium that was able to continue working uh, in most cases through the quarantine and lockdown. Cause they were able to move a lot of these films uh, to, to home to working from home. And uh, so I think it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what's going to happen in the animation scene uh, coming forward. Yeah, no, um, 2020 was a weird year because I can't say it felt empty because there were, there were still plenty of releases, big and small, uh-huh. but it definitely felt kind of empty within the big animation scene because they were like, uh, not counting like the, uh, the Netflix uh, releases. It felt kind of, lacking and that's weird to say because i know some people will like jokingly say like well at least we didn't get an illumination film this year Uh and it's also like i don't know i kind of would have liked to have seen it (laughs) yeah i mean i know it it got delayed what i think it's because a few of the films got delayed and then some of them got you know the whole theater and then uh home release strategy and also, but in, even in my, like, what I like to focus on, the foreign animation, it also felt lacking, even though G Kids had, like, a slew of pretty unique and good releases. And, but it, but it's also, like, by this point in time from last year, I probably would have seen, like, 20 other animated films if I went to animation as film. So, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> so it's, like, it, 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 it definitely feels smaller per se, but luckily there were still a few interesting foreign releases that finally got hit U S shores or there were. Um, and then like we said, like G kids always kind of pulling through with at least a few interesting releases. And then thankfully Pixar was here for us. And yeah, so two glad- films from Pixar. That's true. And I know that, that I read that soul, a lot of it had, had been finished at home that they had the animators working from home. Yeah. And no, that's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. No, uh, soul. And I think the crew to new age was also finished at home. And I know that's why, uh, minions, the rise of grew got delayed because they had to basically like wait until it was okay to go get everything and then finish everything at home. Uh, uh-huh. Like, uh, yeah. the pandemic definitely wrecked a lot of schedules, so uh-huh. we'll, yeah. we'll have to see. In 2019, I saw 36 animated films, uh, and then in this year, I have eight, uh, 16. I have 36, but I had to, like, scrounge around a little for, like, small, interesting releases or, like... Uh, whatever Netflix bought, whatever the DC universe brought over and. Yeah. Oh. I didn't include any, any of the DC uh, straight to DVD, re- straight to streaming releases, or there were some things I did actually watch that I didn't include in my list. So maybe a few more, but, but yeah. yeah. No. And it's like, uh, luckily I was fortunate because of the, everything that happened last year, I was able to, 
partake in an- the Annecy Film Festival online. And I hope, I mean, you can hear my podcast on this on a, on renegadepopculture.com where I co-host yeah. the Renegade Animation Podcast. We talked about how the Annecy Film Festival basically locked out all of the crowd pleasers and just left you with like the, the most artsy uh, and just very director driven animated films. Yeah. I think if yeah. I wasn't just so like happy about the opportunity to try it out, I would have been very disappointed. And I don't know. I don't know if I could recommend everyone try to find a virtual screening or when it's on demand uh, to watch. Yeah, I was very, maybe it's just because it was mostly in French. I was confused. I didn't, <laughs> I thought their website was very confusing during no, the festival. Webs- the website was a mess, even if you turned it on to English. And um, and then it's, like I said, all like the ones that everyone wanted to see. Like, I wanted to see The uh, Calamity, the uh, new film from the people who made Long Way North. Uh-huh. And that was not available to the public because the only ones who could watch all the films were the uh, jury members. So, and like they had yeah. Lupin the Third the First there and then uh on gaku War sound and it, it was just like it was disappointing but there were still a few unique uh unique films there so uh, cool yeah. yeah i watched wolf walkers at tiff as part of tiff virtual screening yeah so same that, that was fun so there were some some festivals uh offerings but let's just dive in talk about the films i'm just doing it in order of my preference <laughs> <laughs> this is how we're doing it. Yeah, no, um, go ahead. And, uh, so let's dive in and talk about it. So my least favorite film, animated film of 2020 uh, was Scoob was my least favorite. Um, I just, I don't understand what they were thinking with this film. I am not somebody who knows anything about Scooby-Doo. Like I have never watched it. I don't know it. But I just thought the to turn it into this generic superhero story just seemed like such a mistake to me. I just was I, it, to me it was just extremely bland, not fun, not a fun mystery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess some of the animation was fine, but I don't know. I was just extremely underwhelmed by this movie. Well, I I have grown up on Scooby Doo. I used to watch it a lot as a kid, and then. Um, I, I, to prep for this film's release for the podcast I co-host, I watched every single direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film just to prep for this, just to have like a point of reference to compare and contrast. And it's not my least favorite, um, but it's, it's definitely in the lower middle half. And like, I, I do think it was fairly mediocre, And not just because they made it into like a superhero thing. Uh, Scooby-Doo has teamed up with Blue Falcon in the past. Um, But mostly because it wasn't really a Scooby-Doo film. It was a, like a Hanna-Barbera universe starter first. Mm -hmm. Then um, a Scooby-Doo film second. And I'm rooting for for the uh, animation studio, Real Effects. They're the ones who did uh, the Book of Life uh, back in 2014. And I don't know what happened with this film, it's budget and look, because like Scooby Doo looks great. He transits, he translates well, but everyone else doesn't. Mm-hmm. And then you get like those awkward moments where like Simon Cow looks. Yeah, what on earth? What, like, first off, a bad cameo. Two, he looks entirely different from everyone else, and that's distracting as heck. And then, like. I liked certain aspects of it. Like, um, I liked the, uh, the approach with Blue Falcon where he was like the bratty son of the original Blue Falcon, where it, like he was like coasting off of the fame and popularity of the name. Though I think Dynamite was the better of the two characters there. And I liked, and I liked Dick Dastardly. I thought, um, Jason Isaac, um, had a lot of fun being a literal mustache twirling villain. But then it does stuff like the whole Captain Caveman sequence, which is never brought up again after that whole thing is over. And I was I'm kind of a fan of Captain Caveman. And I was really excited when Tracy Morgan was going to play him. But then he turns into a basically Tracy Jordan from like his character from 30 Rock. And 
yeah, I was just disappointed, and I, I'm sorry to Will Forte because I know he got a lot of the flack for voicing Shaggy, but I think that was a miscast. I think the only cast member that did well, like I said, outside of like Jason Isaac, was uh, Zac Efron as Fred. So Fred will always be Frank Welker. Like he's been the original Fred for decades now. So yeah, yeah, yeah that no, was a weird choice, and I don't know. I just thought it was super bland. It 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 just anything that if as somebody who doesn't know anything about Scooby Doo, it just felt like it, it. I was expecting a mystery, and it wasn't a mystery at all. And it was just so, I it was just so bland in that it felt like I'd seen this movie so many times before. And, and it's like, why don't you do anything special or interesting or I don't know, why well, make it a bland superhero movie? Well, it's like you can make a Scooby-Doo movie work. You just have to put the story first because yeah, make a mystery. Yeah. Make the mystery. That's what worked about Scooby-Doo on zombie Island. And it, the four follow-ups to that, or the three follow-ups to that film. Mm-hmm. They put the story first. They put the characters first. They made the, the mystery interesting enough to where yeah. it, it's like, it can work. I just, yeah. And this film went through like a lot of production pro- troubles. Like Dax Shepard was going to direct it, but then after 2017's Chips failed at the box office, he got removed from the project and then, I, I don't know. There, and, I don't know, just it needed yeah, something they, to make it unique or special. It just felt so generic to me. Yeah, no, it's it's not a great film. I, I'll say that. I wish it was better. It was like my first real disappointment of the big studio films from this year. So, I, and I know it's like some people were like, "Man, I wish I could have seen it in the theaters." And I was like, "Well, even if we didn't have all that is going on." I still probably wouldn't have cared much for this film. (laughs) Yeah. So then next uh, we have a small film called the next door spy and the Agatha Christie, the next door spy. And this is an animated film uh, from Europe. I forget. I think where Denmark. Denmark. Uh, Yeah. And I like the aesthetic. I like the animation. I think it's nice. But I thought this movie was really hurt from a really bad dub. I thought that it was very cheap and it did not look good at all. Yeah, the matching the English English dub. I wish I could have seen it in, uh, I guess, Danish. like its original language. Yeah. yeah, the original language, because I think it would have looked way better and it just took me out of the i felt like a lot of times it was like is that really what they're saying because it didn't match the scene or what was happening very well it was just odd and and i I didn't think it was a good mystery uh they got these weird uh crocodiles or alligators oh oh oh, that 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 monitor lizard like that lizard um, yeah yeah um, that was bizarre and I don't know. I just did not enjoy it. I mean, if you if you're going to uh, watch a movie from this year about a kid detective, watch Timmy Failure. That was way better than this, unfortunately. Yeah, I got a screener for it and I reviewed it. Um, I didn't include it in, in, in my list. Um, I liked the art style. I did not like how the characters moved. They looked a little too like. Uh, you know, like those paper puppets with like the little metal rings and such. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it was a really, I, I was, I mean, yes, this is not aimed for someone who is 31. I'm not the target audience for it, but I was really bored by it. And I didn't care much for the characters. And I was just wondering what the heck was with the monitor lizard that you got because it kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was wondering if it was like a symbolic element to it, like the, like ever growing stress or something of the main character, but it really wasn't. And yeah, (laughs) I guess the only thing that separates this from Scoob is that it has a more interesting art style. (laughs) Yeah. Like I, I said in my review that I think the lizard is supposed to be charming, but it came off, very creepy and weird and there there was also profanity in the movie which again oh, i just felt that like was, was such the a biggest strange, shock. 
strange yeah. choice. No, that was the biggest shock out of out of that when there I was just kind of bored, 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 and then someone would swear, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, how is this yeah. meant for kids?" It's and no, it was like that's why I just felt like the dub really, really, really hurt it because they don't have to use that word. They could have they could have used any number of words for. I mean, they're trying to make this appeal to teenagers. What I no, mean, no. teenagers aren't going to like this movie. Yeah, they're, of course not. And they're, so they're, it. Well, I yeah. don't know what they were thinking. No, it was a, it's a weird little movie. I don't recommend it. No. Uh, so next up, I have Animal Crackers. And I felt really bad about this because I was pulling for it really hard. Um, because, I mean, normally I don't get involved in kind of the production of a film that much. I try to mm-hmm. you know, stay objective as a critic and not get too emotionally invested in the success or failure of a film, but it was hard with this one because it was just so long and the process and, and getting the distributor was so difficult and, and you felt bad for him that they, you know, we've been waiting for, for four years practically yeah. to get their film just released. And it's like, at the very least, even if it's not perfect, you want people to be able to see it. And uh, so there are a lot of interesting ideas here. And I actually like the animation for the most part. Uh, but it was there was so much going on that the, the, the plot did not work. I actually kind of like this one. So... <laughs> And I'm not saying that's just because me and my co-host talked to the two directors and such. Yeah, um, yeah no, it was, if anybody is following animation, they know about this film's notorious like hunt for a, uh, for a distributor and a release that, and it, it was just a lot. And I actually liked a lot of this film. I, I thought the animation for $17 million was actually pretty good because they kept yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. And then um, I liked the cast. I like for for the most part. I think Danny DeVito was the best one there, and I liked certain aspects of the story. And I liked uh, I liked Gilbert Gottfried as that as Zucchini, the the uh, henchman who thinks he's who who thinks um everyone else is his henchman. And I like I liked some of the humor and dialogue, and I liked. Well, one of the things I liked about Animal Crackers was the fact that they kept the Animal Crackers magical. We live in a world, well, in a day of age of social media and film discussion where it seems like some people just want to have everything ex- explained. And I'm glad that they just said, it's magic. It doesn't matter. Just don't think about it. And uh-huh. I will say, I do think it was a little inconsistent with the. Uh, musical numbers like i think if you're going to be a musical either commit to it or don't because those elements were not the greatest and i also found ian mckellen to be uh kind of like his character horatio to be kind of a weak villain i actually enjoyed the antics of patrick warburton's uh i think brock was his name Uh and and um no, I, I actually kind of enjoyed this one for what it was, and I think the dialogue for me uh, saved the story for me uh-huh. anyway. But I understand why not everyone was fully on board with it, and I'm what? glad at least the director was like he was respectful about the uh, the different responses. Yeah, no, I appreciate that too. I also got to interview them, and so it was a bit of a. Uh, uh, I was a little nervous about posting my review and so I was grateful that they were so grown up about it and mature about it. And, and uh, so, you know, cause it's, it's tough to do sometimes and you don't want to uh, pick on the small guys by any means, but no, I, had no. to my, I had to give my review and I just basically said in my review, I said the problem with animal crackers lies in the convoluted story with too many characters to become invested in. You have Bob and Horatio who are both in love with Talia. Then you have Owen and Zoe who run a circus, but decide to use animal crackers to make it a success. Then you have Owen work for Mr. Woodley with the scientist Binkley to make a new type of dog biscuit. And he might want to manufacture the crackers 
Owen becomes an animal permanently at one point, and then Horatio comes back. The whole thing gets complicated. I struggled to stay engaged in the film. I can That's understand. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a lot at points, but um, I, I mean, I, I I was still pretty. T- I was just happy that this film got released because yeah. sometimes we don't get some films don't get released, and it's a and it's always a shame when that happens so. yeah no i absolutely agree there for sure it deserved to get seen and uh you know their work uh, get uh get viewed by people uh even if i in the end couldn't recommend it doesn't mean that it's not worthy of existence <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so uh, yeah i recommend i i personally recommend it but i definitely recommend a few other netflix films first but that's just me Mm-hmm. Okay, then at my next choice is the Wilbies. I know that a lot of other people had this a lot higher than I did. Uh, so for me, I, I I really liked the animation. I thought that it was fun. I'm just not that super into the style of humor uh, that they had. I didn't think it was funny enough, and I didn't think that the the the, the children kind of won me over enough. I, I don't know. I just, I was disappointed. I thought it was going to be better. I, I thought the, the humor was kind of negative. Uh, and I don't know. I just, I didn't enjoy it. I, I, I wish it had more whimsy, been more charming. Yeah, no, um, I understand that. Uh, the Willoughby's is a very dark com- comedic film. Uh-huh. and um i actually really like this one so <laughs> i'm yeah. sorry but no um, it's fine um and i liked it because of the animation which which had this faux stop motion look to it and i liked the fast-paced physical comedy and then the um impressive visuals like man this is a pretty looking movie just vibrant as heck and um i liked the dark dialogue at points and uh, i mean it's tough because this film is about um, a family where the parent, the current uh, patriarch and matriarch are awful parents and it kind of, it revels in that a little. And I, I was kind of glad that they did not redeem the parents at the end. I uh-huh. think my, I think my problem with the film is that, yeah, I think the, the, not the oldest son, but the daughter and the two, the twins, are definitely underdeveloped as characters. And I know Netflix is going to try to do this for every film that they animated film that they put out, but I, I did not care for the original song that was in there because it, it was kind of like with Klaus, like it was there just to get an original song nomination. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, I, I enjoyed this world, but yeah, you have to be in a certain mood for dark comedy and, a slightly more cynical writing. Yeah. I will also yeah. say that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, if you're, I think it's trying to be something similar to, you know, something like a role doll, like Matilda mm-hmm. you know, with these horrible parents. And, uh, but I don't know. I just felt more bonded with Matilda than I did with any of these kids. And the, the moments of humor are funnier yeah. to me. So it kind of works better. There's a little more whimsy, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's just not like a total train wreck, but uh, yeah, it was disappointing. I was hoping I would love it. Now um, I, I understand that some people aren't fully on board with it. I really loved it. And uh-huh. I, I definitely, I think the only other misstep for me was having Ricky to face as the cat. I just don't like him. And this is just even separating him from like, everything that he's been doing and his shenanigans. Um, no, I, I, I'd recommend it. I really liked it, but I understand if, like, like I said, comedy, well, comedy is subjective and you got to be on board with a dark comedy premise or else you're, you're probably not going to gel with it. So yeah, no, there's no, there's no issues of, of us disagreeing. So. Yeah. So then next I have trolls world tour. And of course this was the one that uh, was the first one to be made prime video on demand and uh, kind of a bit of a scandal in, uh, in what happened with universal and uh, AMC and everything. Uh, But the movie as a whole, 
Um, I thought that it was it was a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, I didn't hate it, but I didn't end up recommending it. Um, I think some of the the animation was nice, and I think it has its heart in the right place of trying to uh, respect all these different kinds of music and different people. But and I certainly liked that part of it better than the message of the original, which was not my favorite. And I thought it was a good decision to get rid of the, what did they call them? The, um, uh, oh, the, the yeah, Kraken. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, I forget uh, the word. Uh, uh, I'll quickly look it up. No, um, I understand. Uh, like, well, I think the, it was the right move to move this to on demand, even though AMC was like, Hey, you can't do that. Um, even though it's like, uh, well, the Bergens, by the way, were the villains of the first film. Um, and it's not like AMC had that much power anyway. They're on a downward slope, so (laughs) they can't really be going out against universe, going against universal. I like this film. I don't think, like I liked it a little more than like Animal Crackers. Um, I liked the aspects of yeah, it's like all these like love and support for every quote unquote culture, which uh, with, which was all represented by the different music genres. And the, the animation I, was. Uh, go ahead. No, the thing I think would have made it better is that if in the end they had truly merged all of the music and and the instead of still remaining their sort of individual denominations for lack of a better word that their individual genres like if the end poppy had been uh you know listening to country music listening to to rock music and it, there was like a true merging but they still remained their individual selves so if you live in pop music world you have to you have to love Same. pop music and you have to listen to pop music. So I felt like they, they kind of didn't, they didn't, it wasn't as much about tolerance as they thought it was. And so they didn't finish it right. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. Like, cause a lot of this films emphasis on like, um, on like a different brand of music and such. And like that you can catch some like LGBT um, elements too, especially with the, uh, the techno trolls, the the little mermaid trolls uh-huh. things, and there are definitely some jokes that I kind of dug, like when they're in the country area, and you can see like those cow things going behind a building, and then a guy, then a one of those country trolls walks out of a plate of burgers. Um, oh, I didn't even catch that. <laughs> I've seen it three times. I think this movie three times. I saw it once at the drive-in, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this movie is harmless. I just don't think it quite worked. Yeah, no, I yeah, I think the big problem is well, I have two. One, I think Branch regressed as a character because yeah. he he didn't have his blue hair like he did last time. He really had nothing to do, and I think yeah, like the film's whole thing is like respect each other and be like like. Be, be like the hot pot of the music world because we all exist and we all need to cooperate with one another. And like, there were interesting elements like the rock, the villain of the film was kind of like poppy, but a rock troll. Yeah. And I definitely did like some of the jokes near the end. Like, uh, like, I mean, unfortunately they show this one in a trailer when the, uh, the pop trolls are trying to sneak into like the rock concert at the end. Uh-huh. And they're like, hi, only true rock trolls can be back here. And they're like, oh, but we are indeed true and like real rock trolls. And they're like 50s rock and roll, like yeah. fashion sense. Or when a uh, branch gets turned into a rock troll, uh, one of our co hosts talked about this and it was his favorite joke where he was like, who wants to get tattoos all over their bodies but under their necks just in case they want to still get a respectable job? And but That's yeah, a no. weird movie. Such a strange concept. Well, they're, they're <laughs> definitely it's not it's not as strong as it could have been with its themes. And yeah, the, the fact that it still ends with a pop song saving the day was not great. And, yeah, and they should have merged all of them. That oh, we're going to be accepting. So now we're going to be listening to anyone can listen to any music. There, we're not going to be defined. Music. We're not going to be defined by by 
you know, these indiv- these classifications anymore. That would have brought everything home and would have made it all made sense. But anyway, let's move on. So next we I have on Gaku our sound. So from going forward here, these are all movies that I liked. And this movie, you know, we talked offline off air that, you know, this is kind of a strange movie. It's not going to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But I thought it was the strongest when they're actually playing music uh, and particularly the scenes uh, with the rotoscoping of the, uh, the musicians playing Mm -hmm. that, that to me was the the strongest part of the the movie. Well, this was, this is like an interesting movie because it's the, uh, it's the first one that you can actually consider to be a quote unquote indie animated film from Japan. Uh I mean, we talked about this on my podcast and my review because it's like, even though we consider jet, like most of the animated films from Japan indie and foreign, just because that's how we categorize them, uh-huh. they're still made with a lot of money put behind them. Not, not, not as much as like a Pixar, but no. And it was like, it took over seven years t- to make. And because the director wanted this to be very close to the comic, to the manga that it's connected to, it's based on. And yeah, I really like this movie. It's my number seven best animated film of the year. And I like it for its offbeat humor. It's kind of like flipping of uh, genre tropes with the whole like, let's make a band. And then they had the whole band breakups thing. And I will say that I think its length is pretty perfect, though it almost touches on being a little too long, which is weird because this is only like 75 minutes long. But I I really enjoyed the offbeat vibe of On Gaku R Sound. It's it's a film I constantly think about, and I rewatch the screener that I got for it a lot <laughs> uh-huh. because it's it, it, it's one of my favorite films, and I was just so happy that it turned out great because it could have easily turned into like a uh, kill it and leave town, which was just a bore to get through. And I just saw it today for the first time, and. I, I it was I like I said I thought the music section saved it for me the the uh, the non music sections uh, I didn't really love but uh but yeah I mean it's definitely worth checking out and I would recommend it mm-hmm. so next up I have the Crudes the New Age uh, next up in my ranking and I I did feel like this movie is very shouty i felt like every scene the characters are just yelling and i hate that in animated films but Mm -hmm. i did love the animation i loved the animation of the original and i thought that this was equally as beautiful um but then i also thought that there were a couple spots where i was like oh what are they gonna do and then they made refreshing choices like the fact that they had the two female characters, I forget their names, the younger. Uh, Epin, you know. Epin, uh Dawn, I think. Yeah, that they didn't become rivals, romantic rivals. There wasn't a love triangle, which oh, I... Oh, thank God for that. Yeah, <laughs> and so I, that was a refreshing choice to me that they made. I mean, there's lots of sort of current uh, discussions that you can have with kids, I think, about this movie. The mm-hmm. whole idea of... Uh, kind of immigrants coming in to this new place there's uh, there's a wall you know that there's class warfare yeah like then what makes things better what things things worse uh you know how can we get along with things that are different all those kind of discussions i think that you can have which i think is good and i i think it's it's positive and I didn't think it was you know, certainly heavy handed with the mess machine. It was just telling these stories. So yeah. I like that. And uh, yeah, overall, I enjoyed it. I watched it uh, Thanksgiving morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, in the, I actually got to see it at the IMAX, which was kind of fun. Awesome. Yeah, I bet yeah. it looked great on that screen. Yeah, it was pretty good on that screen. And so I wish that they kind of did the humor a little bit different. And I wish that Again, I felt like it was kind of the characters are mm-hmm. sort of shouting at, at us a lot. And anyway, so, but I, I still would recommend it. Overall. Um, Yeah, I really like this movie. It's my, it's actually my, uh, what did I put it? Uh, number 11 in my top 20 because I, yeah, I love the animation. I liked the characters. I like that they did flip some tropes about it, around it. And yeah, I was so glad that, 
Eep and Dawn were able to be friends, and they didn't try to do a stupid love triangle, and that the uh, the dads got a pretty good development going on with how they like how they're deaf. They're not great at being dads, but they're bad in their own different ways. And I actually really, I mean, yeah, it's a little shouty at points. I mean, granted, some of them are cavemen, so, <laughs> um, but. I yeah, I liked um the story and I liked the humor. I thought it was a lot funnier than the previous one and yeah, um yeah. I I think the only thing I'd kind of roll my eyes at is that is uh I don't know. I I think some of it was still a little generic like the overprotective dad was still a thing though I thought it had a pretty great punchline at the end where uh even guy like they, you think they're leaving, but they just go and have their own hut while <laughs> Grug, uh, Nicholas Cage's character. Um, yeah, it's just like, I, I don't know. I I liked a lot of the joke setups for this film, yeah. though. It, it's definitely a uh, like I I I really liked it, so I, I was glad it was I was able to see. It. I did not go out to a theater to see it. I waited until it hit on demand. So. All right, so my next choice is A Whisker Away. This was on Netflix that I, well, we watched this. And this very interesting animated film with a, a girl who is trying to get close to a, a classmate of hers. And he loves cats. She ends up turning into a cat in order to, uh, in order to spend time with him. <laughs> And yeah, this movie, I just, I, I didn't overthink, not that people who dislike it are overthinking it, but I just thought this movie was really cute. And the fact that, that she is just the cutest little cat I've ever seen. I was, I was wanted to just stay a cat. It was so cute. Um, the design of her as a cat, I thought was really cute. And I don't know, I just enjoyed it. I, and then it wasn't until after I, that I read some reviews. And I was like, Oh, I did not even think of that. I didn't even cross my mind. Maybe I was just in the right mood. I don't know, but I really did enjoy it and uh, thought it was very sweet. Yeah. I was not a huge fan of this one. I, I, this was very disappointing to me because I love uh, the studio that made this studio Colorado. They did a uh, penguin highway a few years ago and uh-huh. Uh, it was written by Mario Cotta, who did uh, one of my favorite films from 2018, uh, Machia, When the Promised Flowers Bloom. I had a huge issue with the main characters basically stalking and harassing the boy. And I liked the gimmick of the cat, of transforming and such, because it it definitely leads to, an, to a uh, symbolic mi- uh, element of dealing with depression. And... Uh-huh. And but I did like the villain, and I liked the idea of the cat village, and just like I liked everything in the second half. I think just the main character was just unlikable to me because if this was a guy doing this to a bunch of the like if it like the gender roles were reversed, uh-huh. I think we'd be hearing a lot more about it. But since it's like, oh, a girl's doing it, so it's okay, and it's like, um, yeah, just I can don't, see just, that. Just, just don't stalk or harass. You, no matter what gender you you identify as and whatnot, just I guess I didn't see it as that invasive. I mean, I, I it is, I guess, but maybe it was just because it was a cat. I I didn't. No, well, that, I, I mean, know. That's, that's that's kind of the thing I have an issue with because it's like she. I mean, yeah, she did uh, stalk him as a human, and then she did it as a cat to be close to him, close to him. Yeah, but um. But I understand why pe- why some people like it. It just wasn't for me. So fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. All right. So then next, I have "Ride Your Wave," and this is by Masaki Yuasa. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. No, that's, uh, but that's I it. I loved "The Night Is Short." Walk on, girl. I did not like the um the other one. Um, uh, the uh, little, uh, little over, over the wall. wall. I did not care for that at all. And uh, so he's, I guess, maybe hit and miss with me uh, as a animator. I like, I like that he has his own very unique visual style and uh, that he is definitely, this is an artist's 
animator. And uh, this is true in Ride Your Wave. This is a very strange movie, but I did enjoy it. Uh, basically, she, uh, she, her love becomes like it, a, a spirit, a spirit of the water, and she ends up <laughs> like putting the spirit in this this uh, dolphin. Like blue- like I think it was a, uh, I think it was like a beluga whale. And... Yeah, and she so she can be with her love. So she's walking around with this giant. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty crazy. Giant. It, <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, it's giant wa- like water filled yeah. whale doll. Yeah, um, I'm a huge fan of Masaki Yuasa's filmmaking. I loved Lou Over the Wall, and I really loved The Night of Short Walk On Girl despite one little element about it. Um, I really loved Ride Your Way. For me, it w- it's my third favorite animated film of the year. And I liked, it. it's another coming of age story, but it takes it, but it, it's like, it's it's more for like young adults and such. It's like, because it's, it's for those people who are just like finally exiting out of high school and such. And it's literally about finding your wave in life. And I do think that it was very funny and it's very cute and charming. And it's nice to have an, a, a romance film where the characters actually bond with one another. Like they take a good amount of time to, to have the characters bond as a couple before they off the, uh, the boy, the love interest. And I think that's great. Even like, uh, like, I don't know. I, I, I think, this is one of my favorites of the year, and I don't know if it has a chance in getting awards of any kind, but yeah, I, I highly recommend this. I think it's going to hit uh, HBO Max. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, okay. But, or if you can, but e- even then, I'd recommend just buying it's it. It's definitely and- worth seeing. It is a very unique uh, film. The animation is beautiful, right. and uh, it it is a romance and it's also uh it also has a pretty good sense of humor so i definitely recommend it uh it's it's number eight for me on my ranking but Mm -hmm. that's where i have it so number seven for me is onward and i i think onward had such a great heart to it uh, and as somebody who has had a bit of a, a a rocky relationship with my older brother, it was definitely something I emotionally connected with the uh, the story of the two brothers here. And I thought the ending was very bold uh, that they yeah. didn't make everything perfect and nice and uh, that he really did have to sacrifice. I, I thought that was really bold. Of mm-hmm. them, especially knowing that the backstory of Dan Scanlon and the fact that he would make kind of his character not get the necessarily the happy ending that you'd expect, I thought was very interesting. And the world building was really fun. It was different. Um, I, I I think that there's some things in the story that could have been done better. Uh, the quest was pretty easy. You think other people would probably have done it <laughs> over the <laughs> time. Uh, and, you know, some of the characters weren't used. I don't think the best uh, that they could have been, but overall I enjoyed it. And uh, I, so yeah, I had it at seven. Um, I really loved Onward and I know everyone was so hesitant about it because of its premise and I, I understand, but I was following the development of this film and I, I was really look and you know, that this is the thing about Pixar films. They don't always have the best marketing. So you kind of have to take that in mind. Mm-hmm. And so, so it, sometimes it might backfire on how the film looks until you actually see it. Um, but yeah, I really loved Onward. I love the dynamics between the brothers. I'd liked some of the characters, I, I was glad that they had two female characters who were like very much a part of the story with the mom and then the uh, the Manticore, who's voiced by uh, Octavia Spencer. And yeah, no, the I mean, it, uh, this is film. This is the I, the film that defines the uh, it's about the journey, not the destination kind of thing. So I wasn't too bothered by it. 
I did not care much for uh, Tom Holland's character design, just because it. Everybody kind of made this comparison. It looks like Tom Holland's character from Spies in Disguise, mm-hmm. but an elf. And no, I, I thought it was a super touching. And yeah, that ending is hits hard, and mm-hmm. it hit me in a different way, just because something happened early on in my in the year, and I, I I'm not going to go too much into it. Sure. It, it is like, but it connected with me hard and. Yeah, you know, this is Pixar, man. That they're good when they're on the mark or when they're on the ball, they hit it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh I have a number six for me. I have Lupin the third, the first. And this is the first of the at least to my knowledge, the CGI Lupin uh in this style that it felt very uh, reminiscent of something that you might have in Spider Verse or this kind of hybrid that we're getting these days, which I love to see. Mm-hmm. I thought the the action was so well done in this movie, uh, really, really beautiful. Uh, this uh, the story was fun to me. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of the uh, uh, the is is Hitler still alive? Kind of. A yeah, thing it, and it's a it's thing. a very uh uh last crusade Indiana Jones kind of uh-huh. thing, uh, plot. Yeah. Um and, yeah, this, uh, go, go ahead. No, I so I just enjoyed the action, I enjoyed the 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 humor, enjoyed the animation, so mm-hmm. that's why I had it at six. Um yeah, it, funny enough, it's actually my number six as well. Um and it only got beat up by onward. Um so yeah, this is the first CGI animated loop in the third film, and it's the first feature film from the franchise in a good while. He's only been mostly in TV specials and OVAs and the occasional anime series for a while. Like like I said, it's been forever since a actual loop in the third feature hit theaters, and this is by the same director as uh, last year's Dragon Quest Your Story, and I was not a fan of that, so I was. A little worried about how this one would turn out, but reading how the director wanted this to be very much like uh, the 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 uh, loop in the third film everyone likes, the Castle of Cagliostro, which is you know directed by Miyazaki, and um, I really love this movie. It was fun, action packed. Uh, the character dynamics were all pretty great. It was constantly funny, which is. Not always a given with Lupin the Third. I'm a huge fan of the franchise. And I love the voice cast. And that's like the iconic voice cast from the uh, original Red Shirt series with, uh, you know, Tony Oliver as Lupin, Richard Epcar as Jigen, Michelle Ruff as Fujiko, Lex Lang as uh, Goemon, and then uh, Doug Erholtz as Zenny Gata, who had probably some of the best sequences in the film. And it's... It, and knowing how like foreign animation is starting to slowly dive into doing better CGI animation, they're not just making cheap films with it. It looks great. It's probably the best CGI film from Japan uh, so far. And they, but it was also because they were able to make make like they translate the designs well. They uh, they make the movements cartoony. They don't try to make it realistic because that's not what Loop in the Third is. It's not meant to be a grounded series. So I think the only thing downside for me is that the villains weren't all that memorable. And, but mostly just like, I wanted them to leave an impression, but they they didn't, uh-huh. but I did like, it's very anti Nazi message because, you know, screw Nazis. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, so. yeah that was good. I've only seen, this is only my second loop. And of course, seen the, the Miyazaki one, I, I haven't seen any of the others, so it, it's uh, it's a tough franchise to get into depending on where you start. But luckily, there's no continuity to focus on, so you can just jump into any uh, any of them. It just gets a little rough at the beginning of the franchise, but you move. On, but it gets better as time uh-huh. go, went on. So cool, yeah. yeah. All right, so my number five is My Hero Academia Heroes Rising. I think this is one of the more underrated films of 2020, not just animation. I think in general, I I think that if people weren't so close minded about anime, that there's a lot to like about this movie. I think if you like 
the MCU, I think the, you could like this movie. I feel like it has a lot of the same sort of feeling of of uh, the superhero movies that we've been getting lately, and the uh, the I think the 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 end battle here is very well done and very oh, intense, very yeah. emotional. The mm-hmm. animation was really good, and I think they do a really good job as someone who doesn't watch the show. They do a really good job of filling us in 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 both of these the last two my hero academia movies at the very beginning they give a little you know explanation of what's been happening and not all of the series movies do that and i don't think they necessarily have to that's fine if they want to make a movie just for their audience that's fine but mm-hmm. i like the fact that in this case they do and so you're everybody's able to enjoy it and uh i don't know i just i thought it was great I really liked it. Yeah. I'm anybody who knows me, I'm very finicky about how I respond to franchise films. I don't tend to like a lot of them because a lot of them tend to be the same and they have the same issues. And I watch my hero academia. And one thing that I have adored about these two films is that they get referenced in the show. Not like, not like, like in a dialogue or a tidbit, like in like a, a filler story for the anime. But just because, but they show like a flashback of All Might when he was in the in the first film, and I was like, oh my gosh, they actually reference it. Yeah, I was not now cool. for the, just quickly on the first film. I was kind of okay on it. I thought it was like a tech demo of what they what they were able to do with the with the uh, the new film Heroes Rising. Now Heroes Rising, that's a good franchise film. I thought for well, first off, they actually have all the characters do something. They don't just pick a handful and then throw then throw the rest away which i part of me was really disappointed about that with the first film because it's like my least favorite and mostly everyone's least favorite character minetta got so much time on the first film so i was really happy to see the other characters do stuff and well it will and i think the animation was better than the first film like I, this, like Heroes Rising has way better animation, and that, like you said, the last fight is incredible. And yeah, no, My Hero Academia is a franchise that's it's it's probably a good gateway anime to get into because it's like it's superheroes. I will say I didn't think the villain was all that great, though. I thought Johnny Young Bosch, who was the voice actor for him or for the English dub at least, did a great job. But uh, other than that, yeah, I felt I mean, like he was kind of. Thanos adjacent. I mean, it kind of reminded me. I, oh, the yeah. movie as a whole reminded me of Endgame quite a bit. Yeah, no, uh, it definitely has some of those elements. But yeah, um, this was one of the most successful indie films <laughs> I, or foreign slash indie films of the year before you know everything went down uh-huh. the drain. So yeah, yeah, no, I, rec- I it's one of the few films that uh, franchise films that I actually bought, and I don't do that a lot. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Well, my number four is Over the Moon, and I is same with you. Yeah, same number with four. me. Hey, yeah, yeah. Yes, I really enjoyed this film. I thought that uh, it had a lovely message of hope, and I really loved the lead character, and the the animation was beautiful, and I I liked when she got to the moon, and her kind of figuring out what uh she was going to do now that it wasn't exactly the way that she had been taught Mm -hmm. kind of coming to terms with that and uh coming to terms with her father and him moving you know quote unquote moving on and how she was going to deal with that and i i just thought it was a very sweet movie and i i really liked at least the the two main songs the uh, um, ride, r- yeah, ride to the ride moon. rocket to the moon. Yeah, yeah, was really good. And it was. In the the song that Felipe Sue sings uh, when they get to the moon. I like both of those uh, quite a bit, and so I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this was a great movie, and this was Glenn Keane, who was a veteran Disney animator who worked on like The Little Mermaid. He was the director behind Deer Basketball. And he was going to direct uh, Tangled, but then uh, health issues came up and he had to drop out. And this and this film was animated by Pearl Studios, the ones who did 
uh, 2019's uh, Abominable um, for DreamWorks. And yeah, no, this was a very mature film about moving on and dealing with change. Like literally the moon goddess was named Shang Yi, and I'm sure that was intentional. And it's a very smart movie. It has dialogue that kind of intertwines with what's going on. If you pay attention to the, to uh, what the characters are saying and what's going on in the, the scene. And I like, I even liked the little brother who I thought was going to be the most annoying thing. Um, but I liked his no barriers gimmick because, and I talk about, you can hear a lot of the, these thoughts in my reviews or in the podcast um, where like, it seems like a lot of me like dialogue and phrases have double meanings behind them. And I, yeah, I liked the music for the most part, and I the the Moon Kingdom looked great. Um, I think the only downside to it was I think uh, Ken Jeong's character uh, Gobi could have had a little more of a satisfying ending. Like I, I think he did; he was the most underdeveloped of the side characters. But I thought uh, his his musical number was also very sweet, and he. Um, was able to sing that himself but yeah no for a first film for glenn keen i i thought this was fantastic so yeah i highly recommend it yeah i really really enjoyed it too uh so (laughs) next up i have soul uh for my ranking and i think that this is a very bold ambitious film I I understand why it's the number one for most people, probably for you as well. Um, it's my number two, actually. Number two, okay, good. Yeah, so but, it, but I could easily have a tie with my number one. So <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah, yeah, and so I I and I like the idea that it's trying to say about about the danger. At least this is my interpretation: the mm-hmm. danger of getting lost in your passions and. Uh, and that he has worth as just him for who he is, not about what he accomplishes in jazz. And that's what I I took from the movie, and I appreciate that, and I like it. Uh, I do think that it gets a little muddled uh, with the second act when he's Mm -hmm. turned into a cat uh, or swapped with a cat. The the whole cat. I think that... The whole body swap. I think that that kind of was not great. Um, As far as storytelling, I kind of wish the movie had been a short, I think it would have maybe been better. Um, But I, and I, I don't know if I think 22's character really like had the emotional oomph that they were expecting it to have maybe with her journey. Um, But I still overall certainly recommend it and certainly like it. I just, it's actually maybe not that high for me as far as Pixar rank when I'm doing my Pixar ranking and, and the Pixar, you know, that's an embarrassment of riches. So it's hard to do a ranking, but uh, my expectations were super high for this because I love Pete doctor and I love uh, inside out and up and his previous films. And so there is a little bit of a disappointment that I didn't, love it but i did like it and i do admire it and i think it's pretty incredible that they would make that would make something this experimental on such a budget that that i think that's really cool so i don't know i i uh i it's just a weird movie for me because i feel like i'm kind of bristling against all the masterpiece talk because to me it wasn't a masterpiece but i still do like it if that makes sense. Um, no, I, I understand. This is a, well, first off, I will say I do push back against some people like, and this is mostly bad animation fans and it's not against you or like people who are not fully on board with this film. I understand and agree to some parts of the uh, criticisms this film gets, but if you want to see Pixar and Disney do more, slightly more adult animated films, uh-huh. Soul is what what it's going to have to look like. like. It's what it's going to look like because Soul is a very mature film, and it, and it has a lot of like deep subject matters about the human life, emotions, and like the soul. 
and um, and we talked about this on one of our recent episodes. And I was a really big fan of this one, and not just because I got a screener for it and I was able to watch it before <laughs> uh, its yeah. release. Um, I love the story. It hit me very close because there was a part of my life where I was in a lost soul um, moment in time. And then I found my passion again. It's just like, it's a film that I think is like, and me and my co-hosts were talking about this. It's probably the first uh, Pixar film to be aimed more at adults, but kids will probably understand it. Though I understand it's not the most appealing film to, to tell your five-year-old to watch with the whole, uh, like, hey, you want to watch a film about um, a, someone having an, existent- an existential crisis? Um, but I will say the the second act with the cat, with the body swapping thing, raised some eyebrows, but not just because uh, Jamie Foxx's character got sent into the cat body. I actually liked some of the antics with the cat. It's more... 22 get, getting put inside Joe, uh, Joe Gardner's bar, uh, body. And to some of the implications that, that comes with, we had a huge debate, not a debate, but a conversation about this. And even though it, there are some things that kind of help it, like the, like souls are Pixar's first non-binary characters. It's still a white person voicing 22. And I, I like Tina Fey and I thought, thought she was pretty great. I think they could have negated some of the controversial talk um, of 22 if they casted like Tiffany Haddish or Rashida Jones. But, yeah, I mean, because 22 doesn't have a race. So it just no, because so, her voice actor is, is white doesn't mean that 22 is white. No, but it's, but it, it, it's, but it's like looking outside of that. And yeah, it, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I just, I guess I felt like that I, I, once I was able to kind of hack through it, I kind of got the message, but I, I feel like it got kind of muddled the message. And it's mostly a film about just like what you do does not define you as a person. And you, and like the whole thing with the cat was because Joe needed to see someone else living his life through a different perspective. So he watched 22 live as him. And that like the barbershop scene is probably the best scene in the entire movie. Just because, there, because there's a lot of layers to what they're talking about. And it, it, like, I really loved it. I think it is one of my upper favorites. I think I, I think all three of Pete doctor's films are in my top three. So wow. <laughs> and, and, I have yeah. to, and I have to give a shout out to Kemp powers, the co-director of this. He's also the director of the upcoming uh, one night in Miami. Um, I just thought he did a good job with the film and just bringing uh, more of his perspective onto the story. And if you watch the inside Pixar documentary series on, uh, I think Disney plus, uh, yeah, uh-huh. it's Disney. Well, duh, it's Disney Plus. It's a Disney. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, he, I think watching that helps a little. Um, uh-huh. And then also, if you're if you're clever enough to watch the second episode of it, they talk a little bit bit about Luca, which I'm excited for. But anyway, yeah. I I really liked Soul. I it's one of my favorites, but I understand why some people may not be on, fully on board with it. Yeah, I. I would probably have it in the like 13, 14 range as far as me as my ranking. Yes. I haven't done. No, I haven't, I'm kidding. <laughs> I haven't done my uh, Pixar ranking yet, but I, uh, I still like, it's, it's just tough. I always say there's like a 10 car pile up for my number one in when it comes to Pete doctor. But I, I mean, when it comes to Pixar, I, yeah. I, it is my, I, I think it is my least favorite Pete doctor movie. Um, I don't know. I just, there's something about when Riley says, you know, that I miss home or, or that just has this emotional punch that got me more yeah. um, than in this. And, and yeah, I think it's cool to make a adult film from Pixar. I, I don't know. I always try to, I always try to judge a film for what I think they're trying to be. And there when i was watching this i was like what are they trying to be are they trying to be an adult animated film or are they trying to make this appeal to children and failing 
And so there was a question of that for me that, and I don't know if I know the answer to that. I would be curious to talk to them and see, because I, um, let's, I, it's tough because this is what I think being an adult or an anime film aimed more adults is going to be. It's not going to be like family guy or a sausage party from 2016. It's going, Uh it, it needs to be, a film that's a little more philosophical and even though, but I'm sure like kids can grow up, like be attached to the plot of just trying to find their spark because they're still young. They probably it's not about them. trying to find your spark. It's about that, that it's about how your spark can lead you astray. Can that your spark is basically not well, a lie, it, 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 but it kind of is a lie that it's well, not it, who it's, you are. It's not who gives well, you. What well, that, well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. It's like they, it's like fi- it's not just f- trying to find that spark. It's finding what makes you you. More. And yeah, yeah, that, like I'm, I'm just saying, like I, 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 know, I guess I just have a strong sense of like. It, like because I have to deal with so many bad animated fa- animation fans where they're just like, I want my animated films to be more adults and to be taken seriously. Yeah. And Soul is going to be what that looks like. And then people are like, well, I don't want that. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm going to pull my hair out of my head if you, uh, like if you don't if you don't do. I mean, you know, fan fandom stuck. So that, I'm not dis- I'm not saying you're part of that. I to be clear clear i'm very respectful to people for for like for the issues that they have with this film and i understand where you're coming from but you know it's like it's the first time pixar has tried to tackle something like this and it might not fully work but it's i i really respect that they did something like that and i'm glad disney did that because hopefully this means now other studios can do that and not every film needs to do that but yeah, no, I agree with that actually. I mean, I think I'm I think it's very bold. I think it's very ambitious. I uh I think the animation is absolutely gorgeous. It's certainly uh, we're talking about degrees of praise, I guess, for yeah. me with this one. Um and uh that you know that it's it's uh I did I did enjoy the film and I did uh think it's a uh a, a very a very ambitious film. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Oh, we could probably have a yeah. whole episode. Maybe we should just about, <laughs> no, about it was, soul. Yeah, um, no, we, it's definitely something that's easy. That this is a film that can easily go for like an hour, hour and a half to yeah. it, So yeah. <laughs> I think that was good. Right. Um, yeah. So my number two, and I feel like it's the movie everybody forgot about, is Shaun the Sheep Farmageddon. Well, I it's a Netflix this, film, so <laughs> yeah. I thought this movie was so cute. I really enjoyed it. I thought the alien was adorable. I I mean, I, I feel like I could just watch Sean and his friends order a pizza like all day, every day. I thought, I loved the animation after I kind of thought that early man was a miss. I didn't really enjoy it very much uh, aside yeah. from the animation. Um, mm-hmm. So to me, this was a welcome back to form for Ardman. And I thought it was funny in, in the spirit of an old school silent movie kind of humor to it i thought it was so cute and i i don't know just the whole sequence in the grocery store was so funny and cute and and i and a lot of people were disappointed by it but i I mean i loved it wasn't as good as the original so i guess that's the, the the struggle but i still really enjoyed it so yeah, unfortunately, this one kind of got buried because it took a while for this film to finally get a distributor because Lionsgate just doesn't know how to distribute Ardman films. This is this yeah. was the, this was going this was this would have probably been their third attempt, but since they failed with Early Man, and I like Early Man, but that's another t- conversation piece in general. Um, but I'm glad that Netflix picked it up. And unfortunately, because it's Netflix, you get one trailer and that's it. And <laughs> you kind of have to be aware of when they're dropping uh, these films. And yeah, I think I like the first movie overall at some points more, but I definitely really liked uh, Farmageddon. It's that, yeah, like you said, it's very cute. It's at, 
uh, my number 10 spot. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought the film had a better stor- story or at least a little more interesting story and at least a more interesting villain. Um, and I liked the jokes with that came with it. And I thought uh, Sean with the alien was adorable. So cute. Um, I, and I liked the jokes that were with like the hazmat guys and like, especially like when one of the hazmat guys uh, suit wearing people is, Oh, gets a soda and then opens it up and then tries to drink it, but has that helmet on like the, the whole outfit on still. And he's just like, Oh, then tosses the can away. I thought the villain was a little more interesting here. I think the problem with Farmageddon is the side characters. I just, I didn't care much for the farmer this time around. And maybe it's because I've seen the, the Netflix cartoon that I think premiered, uh, next to the release of Farmageddon. Uh-huh. Um, and it, it's just like, I didn't care much for the farmer and his antics of trying to get more money because I thought that's what the first film did. And like, does it great yeah. um, with, with the dynamics there and Blitzer, uh, the dog hat, like, I don't know. I, I thought they fumbled in some areas and I wish the other sheep had more screen time instead of just being roped into whatever the, the, uh, the the farmer was doing, but overall, I really loved uh, Farmageddon. I definitely recommend it. It's very cute, and yeah, it's a great movie. So yeah, yeah. All right. Well, number one for me was Wolf Walkers. Was my number one film uh, in total, not just animated films. I I love Tom Moore. I love his movies. I've loved every single one of his films, including this. I Song of the Sea is very special to me. Uh, it uh, I saw it after my cousin had passed away and uh, had left. She left two little little boys behind, and so Ben's journey in that movie really meant something yeah. to me. And and I mean everything about that movie. Just the animation is so gorgeous and. And uh, so I, I was really excited about this. And to me, it totally lived up to the expectations. I uh, loved both of these uh, girl characters, their journeys. And I think that their, uh, their father was a really interesting character because he's trying to protect them and trying to help them. But uh, he is, is really hurting them in his in his attempt to be a protector he's kind of a sort of a, a quasi villain in a way and yeah, yeah. Like, um yeah so yeah i saw this one during tiff uh as well and i was tempted to make a joke and say pets united was my number one favorite film but that would have been a terrible terrible lie of course wolf walkers is my favorite animated film of the year it it had to be it's tom moore it's cartoon saloon it's G kids as well. They, they help the theatrical distribution of this on top of uh, Apple plus being the streaming exclusives service. I, yeah, this, this movie just kind of amp, like amps up everything. That's great about Tom Moore and his films. So like the animation is great. It, it kind of calls back to a lot of that uh, time period of when Don Bluth and Disney, like during the seventies and eighties. Uh-huh. And I, I just love the dynamic between the two girls and how uh, it, it it reminded me of a lot how Totoro has the two the, like yes. in that in that kind of thing. And now my family and I will like when we say like we want like a cake or like a baked good or something, we say Town Tasties, and cause that's what uh, the the wolf girl says calls them. And yeah, I like the dynamics with. Uh, Robin and her dad and the dad is just trying to be protective but he's been brainwashed by the uh by the main villain who is Oliver Cromwell a very notorious person if depending on in history depending on what side of the ocean you're on because if you're in England you like him but if you're in Ireland and and such you hate this guy he is one of the worst people of all time (laughs) and Oh, yeah, my. I didn't even realize that that's who he was. Uh, yeah, when but I, they don't they don't say it. They're kind they're not they're kind of subtle about it, but they're also like the, if you I I like looking up this kind of stuff. Um, huh? And I love the whole sequence with the two with the wolf 
the when the two girls when they're wolves and they're running and stuff. That's some of the best animation. If you were part of Annecy, that's what they showed in the work in progress section. And and I love like how it looks like Irish art folklore art, like and like wood like woodcut art. And um and it's definitely a dark. This is also kind of like what I think about with a m- movie that has more of an edge or more that's more mature. Because mm-hmm. this is a scary movie, and it's a very adult movie um, with its themes. And I yeah. mean, and yes, and yes, the Lord Protector is not a like a very fleshed out or complex villain, but he works for the plot. It's not like a Marvel issue where it's like, well, everyone else is great, the villain's not great, but everyone else is great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, people compare it a lot to Princess Mononoke, and I can totally see that. But to me, I think I felt even more sort of attached to these two girls than I feel for the characters in Princess Mononoke. I mean, I, they're they're different. Princess, Princess Mononoke is more of a battle story. It's more well, it, gritty, it, it, more bloody. It, I can understand the comparisons. I think they're different movies uh, mm-hmm. compared, like in terms of tone and like what their message and commentary is about, even though they have, they have overlapping themes, but in general, yeah, Wolf Walkers is great. And the fact that so it's won so many awards with uh, film guild critic guilds and such makes it me kind of hopeful that it might take over, take home an Oscar, but we'll have to see. Yeah. I think it's, it's a tall order with soul. I, I, I don't I would be sh- I would be shocked I would love it because yeah. it's my, fa- my no, favorite no. but I don't think now, it's now, now if you want an intense debate that's something you have to look for is this which one should win more soul or wolf walkers and I mean I I'm just I it, just being realistic I think that uh, that it's there's no way I, I would be shocked if I if they were I mean if if I a film like Klaus can't beat uh, Toy Story Four, which I loved, but was way more divisive than Soul. Um, yeah, I and, love- uh, and it's not going to happen. Uh, with, no. but still, I, it's still a great film, and people should see it. And uh, yeah, know, it's worth no, getting. It's worth getting the seven day free trial of Apple Apple Plus just to watch this, and then cancel. <laughs> if you have to. There's a there are a few good things on Apple Plus. I know everybody likes to just. Um, but that, but that's for another time. I can talk yeah. like, like I, I recommend watching Ted Lasso on there. That's a great show. Oh, um, but, yeah, um, but yeah, Wolf Walkers is the f- major reason to get, uh, Apple plus and hopefully with its support from G kids, I hope that that means there's a physical release coming, but we'll have to see about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. Uh, we co- covered a lot of different films in this, and uh, there's, it was a very interesting, eclectic year for animation. And so if you haven't seen most of these films, I recommend. I, I think they're all at least worth, uh, they're all interesting and different. And so I'd say go check them out and let us know in the comments what you think. Uh, of these or maybe you saw some other ones that we didn't talk about you put in the comment section we'd love to hear your thoughts and Cameron where can people find you well you can find me on my website camsiview.biz where I uh, do a series of animation reviews called the other side of animation it's where I talk about everything that's mostly like non-Disney and Pixar though I've decided recently that I'm going to talk about um, like every once in a while, I'll talk about a Disney or Pixar film, but I just wanted to give everything else like its own time in a spotlight. You can also find me on renegadepopculture.com where I co-host the Renegade Animation Podcast. It used to be called the Tuned Up Podcast, but we decided to change it. Um, but uh, that's where me and my co-host Mike um, talk about animated films and shows. Um and you can find me on Twitter at Cam's Eye View. And I have my own Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash Cam's Eye View. Uh, C-A-M-S-E-Y-E-V-I-E-W. Um, Great. And that's where you can find me. 
Great. And we'll have all that in the description section. Make sure you all are checking it out. And yeah, you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. Also, you can find me at the Hallmarkies Podcast. I have a bunch of interviews and fun stuff over there. I'm going to be covering for Rotoscopers, the Sundance Film Festival, particularly from an animation angle. It's going to be very exciting. We have, I'm going to be interviewing as many of the creators of the animated shorts and there is one animated feature there that i'm uh, going to be trying to get a hold of everybody um, but it's going to be a really fun series i did the first interview today and uh, i think uh, people are going to enjoy it so make sure to check over there rotoscopers for all of your animation coverage so thanks so much this was a lot of fun i really appreciate it and uh, yeah we'll have to talk again about 2021 animation <laughs> Yeah, no, I I can't wait to talk about it. So have me on anytime. So all right. Bye, everyone. Bye.